Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to this fourth Sunday of Advent. Christmas is coming. It is almost here. And in these still shortening days and lengthening nights, we look for light wherever we may find it. And we live in a sure and certain hope that it is coming. So on this morning, I thank you for being here with me to be part of this sacred time and sacred place. We join together in our call to worship. Unexpectedly, the time came. The child was born. The Savior of the world is here. Unexpectedly, the angels told the shepherds of the newborn Savior. The Savior of the world is here. Unexpectedly, the shepherds went and found the child lying in a manger. The Savior of the world is here. We wait for Christ to come again. We wait for Christ to enter our world and lives in a new way. Come, Lord Jesus, come. As I came to church this morning, I am listening to Sirius Radio and I'm listening to Christmas music. And uh, the world is out to get me. Because I knew I was coming to sing our traditional hymns and I got up this morning and it was drizzly and cold and dark. The first hymn I hear on the radio is Medikalikimaka, Merry Christmas in Hawaiian. I thought this is not fair. <laughs> so we are going to we are going to do our best to put our heart and soul and sing with your eyes. Voices United 38. Angels we have heard on high. Love bade me welcome, but my soul drew back. 
it's hard to take in the enormity of God's love made flesh in Jesus Christ. We look at the candles, we enjoy the special music of the season. It's easier to listen to the radio or buy the red cup at the coffee shop than to dwell on the truth. The psalmist knew it long before Jesus. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him great power to redeem. God became one of us, out of love for all of us, then and now and forever. When we light the candle of love, we stop in awe of God's unending love. Whatever we face in life, God's steadfast love surrounds us. Voices United 220. But the Magi knew. 
The Magi knew things that no one else in Bethlehem outside of Mary and Joseph knew. They knew the truth of the world. So this morning as we ask, who are the Magi? I encourage you to keep your ears open and your eyes open to hear and see the information that might come to us from places we never expected it. Wisdom from afar that we never knew was out there. God has written into the stars, into the universe itself, the great code of life and love. And we need to be prepared to listen to the wisdom that brings it to us. Let us take a moment to pray. Holy One, we give you thanks for the wise ones among us. Women and men who can read the stars, whether they are in the sky or in the world around us, and bring us the truth of God's design and love through history. Help us to value and respect the wisdom that you have written into the universe, that goes before us and will linger after us, that we may understand and be part of this great life of love that you have called for. This day and always. So, uh, I'm losing track of days, so I don't know if it was last week or the week before. We did uh, No Crowd on Eastern Street, which is one of our few Canadian carols. This morning we're going to do perhaps the better known of the Canadian carols. This was written in the 17th century in Quebec. This is Voices United number 71, it was in the moon of wintertime. <laughs>
Our first scripture reading this morning is from 2 Samuel 7, verses 1 to 11 and 16. Now when the king had settled in his house, and the Lord had given him rest for all the enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. And that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan. Go and tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I may have moved among, about among all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep to be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may live in their own place, and be disturbed no more. And evildoers shall afflict them no more as formerly. From the time that I have appointed judges over my people Israel, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. Our second reading is from Luke 1, verses 26 to 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to, to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. And he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God, and now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be since I'm a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called the Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her. He will be born barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. He read today's reading.
one challenge all of us faced in ministry when we began uh, to realize what this um, change in reality was going to bring upon us was lamenting the loss of singing in the church. And so I'm so grateful to folks who have continued to make the music rich, even though we can't sing. So thank you to both Kurt and Betty for their contributions in bringing this place to life, even though we can't sing. And I couldn't do this alone, and I thank everyone who makes the reality of coming together for worship possible. That has been your gift to me in this season of Advent, and I thank you for it. There is a reality that when things go wrong, or things go differently, people step up. And this morning, this is a story of someone who stepped up. This is the story of Mary. I call this telling her story. I think most of us know the Christmas story pretty well. It's focused on the birth of Jesus in that cattle shed in Bethlehem all those years ago. At one of the United Church Bruce Ministerial Tuesday morning monthly breakfasts, when we were still able to meet on a monthly basis, I made a comment in passing that has roundabout led me to the sermon this morning. What I said to my colleagues was, well, of course, we wouldn't have Christmas, except for a woman. This is profoundly true. It is Mary's story that results in the birth of Jesus. It's also one we tend not to talk a great deal about in our Protestant traditions. They do a better job of sharing Mary's story in our Roman Catholic and our Orthodox sister churches. We, historically, would rather focus on Jesus than focus on his mother. So humor me for a few moments in the week before Christmas. Let's consider the story of the mother of Jesus, the story of Mary. Mary's background is relatively unknown. Everything we know we heard this morning. We know she has an older relative, Elizabeth, who until very late in life did not have any children. We know she was engaged to Joseph, who although a commoner, traced his lineage back to King David. He, at least, had a pedigree. If you're planning a story from the beginning, you plan to have someone in the center who is important, who is a somebody. But that was not the way of God. God chose someone who was, in the words of Scripture, least of these, who was just like us. It was only some 30 years after the fact that those writing the Bible stopped for a moment and asked, but who is Mary? When you're a nobody, when you're a least of these, the last thing you expect are angels. Angels are not for the faint of heart. I talked about this when I asked the question, who are the angels? We have this cute cuddly version in our heads, but that is not an angel in this case. And in the last hymn, we're going to sing of these angels. The Hebrew word seraph is in seraphim, means fire. The angels were visions of fire completely outside of normal reality. The other word for angels translates literally as messengers, as in people who are just like you and me, but who come with a message for God. But historically, we've said the angel that visits Mary is an archangel, an angel of power, more like the seraphim. You're a young woman. You're engaged to a good, simple man who will provide decently for you and your future family. It's not an elegant life ahead, but it is honest, and it's the best that can be expected in your social situation. But then, an angel appears to you to let you know you're expecting, that the father of the child is not the man you're going to marry that this child will hold a special place in the future plans of God. What do you suppose your reaction is going to be? Oh, shoot. 
The writers of the Bible are kinder, I think, to Mary's memory than I'm sure was the case originally. It would have to be a man to write, Blessed am I among women. I think most of us realize that wouldn't have been Mary's first reaction. What I think is completely true in the account is Mary's comment. How is this possible? Whether we believe in miracles or not, we have to sympathize with Mary's situation. How is she going to tell Joseph that she's pregnant and the baby's not his? This is the man she's supposed to marry. This is a culture in which women are better than dogs, but not as valuable as cattle. Let me ask each of you, what do you think that conversation would be like for the two of them to have? Um, Joseph, honey, now don't be angry, but there's something we need to talk about. Fortunately for everyone involved, Mary's chat with Joseph was forestalled by Joseph's own angelic visit. Now men are known to pretty much argue with anyone. But seldom is it wise to argue with angels. Joseph was brought to an understanding of his own part in this narrative and welcomed Mary as one of his own. And so the story continues. Again, we see proof of the male authorship of the Gospels. A very pregnant Mary is carried from Nazareth to Bethlehem. I would think the only thing more uncomfortable to a late pregnancy than walking would be the back of a donkey, feeling every stone under hoof as a bump on its spine. Pleasant. Joseph's lineage back to David no longer seems so advantageous as when he proposed. Or maybe it was just that stupid census to blame. Either way, God's wondrous plan did not seem so wondrous halfway from Nazareth to Bethlehem. God's name may have been used along the way, but I'm not sure it was done so in a way that I can relate up here. To add insult to injury, to rub salt in the wound, all those who had rushed by Mary as she waddled her way from Bethlehem snapped up all the guest rooms that were to be had. Bethlehem was not a big place to begin, and there was literally no room at the inn. Joseph was a smart enough man to realize the open streets were not going to do, and through sheer persistence and a kind innkeeper, they were able to make do in the cattle shed at the back of an inn. All told, it wasn't that bad. It was relatively quiet, and they were away from all the stares of the other guests. Mary was not exactly in any sort of mood to socialize. Birthing happens. A child is indeed born. And then the story wanders off to wise men arriving with gifts for this newborn baby. And then? The story just sort of peters out. The next time we hear about Jesus, he is already 12 years old, amazing rabbis at the local temple. How is it that he gets from 0 to 12 in one easy biblical story? I don't think I really need to say it. Of course, it was his mother looking after him and making sure he stayed out of trouble. Even when you're the son of God, I'm sure that the terrible twos are really not that much better. Yes, we understand that Jesus was fully human and fully divine, but no matter how much God was in him, he was his mother's child. And who he became was at least as much her doing as it was anyone else's, human or divine. So this nobody did a pretty good job along the way. This woman plucked from obscurity and told by angels she was part of God's plan, fulfilled her place in history admirably well. And we have a choice in the story we read. We can assume that Mary was someone different than us, better than us, far and above anything we are capable of. 
or we can assume that obscure Mary was really just like us in pretty much every way. This is an important decision we make. This decision places us within the story or excludes us from the story, depending on which way we go about deciding. You can probably already guess my bias. I think we are all Marys. I think we are all capable of being visited by angels and having the world turn on our visions. <clears throat> what has God, through God's messengers, asked each of you to do? I believe we are all asked. I believe many hear those messages, while some do not. I think that the good in the world is worked in those times when we hear our angelic messengers. Yes, there was only one baby born in the world with Mary. But hope can be born each and every day by each one of us. We do not have Jesus here with us, but in keeping Jesus' message alive, we keep the spirit of the divine present in this world. So often when we speak of role models in the church, it is to Jesus that we look. I'm not sure that's the best choice. We are not and will never be Jesus. Jesus was once and only. The sacrifice that Jesus made was sufficient for all time, and we do not need to be part of that sacrifice. Mary, however, offers a far better model for us to aspire to. Mary still had to sacrifice. Again, Nazareth to Bethlehem on a donkey, pregnant. Mary gave of herself that her child could make a difference in the world. Mary walked with her son, even as he gave of himself to the cross. That required a sacrifice that is beyond painful to watch your child die. But Mary's sacrifice is human and understandable. I think we can all be Mary's. I think we can all sacrifice that much that the will of the divine stays alive and powerful in the world. When Jesus died, who was it that kept his memory alive? The Gospels were not written for some 30 years after his death. It was his friends. It was his mother. It was nobody's, just like you and me, who were touched by the power of this man. Mary was a nobody, an obscure nobody about whom we know absolutely nothing. Yet through Mary, great things were possible. Great life was possible. Hope and love were born into the world. I think we can all be Mary's. I think we can all share in that moment of birthing hope and life and love. We know the story. We know the beginning and its end. And it's amazing, not ending, but beginning again forever. In that, we are changed people. In that, we understand the sacrifice of Mary and open ourselves to hearing angels, to hearing our part in the story. As Christmas comes, and love is born into the world each and every moment, stop and listen. Listen for hope. Listen for life. Listen for love in your family, in each other, in the world around us. In the past narrative of a mother who gives her all for the child that will change her life, for the child that will change the world. Listen. Live. Hope. Love. This is the gospel. This is the good news. Amen.
another one of my favorite carols. You're going to be terribly tired of me saying another one of my favorite carols, because I love almost all of them. Voices United 76. See Amid the Winter Snow. Yes, Jim. Um, Excellent. 
I'm going to pull down so you can hear me better. Um, I'd like to thank the member of St. Andrew's congregation. We are a very wonderful congregation. Um, through the insight of certain people in our congregation, we still had the uh, Christmas tree for white gifts. We still had the mitten tree. We, we couldn't have our potluck, so what do we do? We bring the toys and that and put them underneath the trees. I'm very pleased to say that there was brought in 72 pounds of food, three boxes of out, outdoor, not outdoor attire, and it was all done in a matter of two weeks. So I think St. Andrews has definitely the true meaning of Christmas, love. Thank you. Any other announcements? Fantastic. I had people this morning ask me, so that's great. So I want to pick up on Carol Ann's uh, announcement of your generosity. We have continued to meet in person. Some people have, for a variety of reasons, continued to watch online. But whether you have been in person or whether you've been watching online, your generosity has been amazing. For things like the mittens, for the, the tree at the back, for the food donations, but also for your continued support of the ministry and life of this place with your, with your donations, your thanksgivings, and your tithes. And the only two words that do justice to your amazing contributions are thank you and hallelujah. <laughs>
And now we pray in our voice the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And we have music again. Voices United number 75, While Shepherds Watched.